Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. You know, um, I have to tell you, I am all about self-improvement and helping others. And so I realized, given my current living and working situation, at home I'm in the basement, and at school I'm in the lower level. So I'm always up and down stairs. So I decided I'm going to write a book, How to Fall Down Stairs. Because, and those of you that are slow learners, don't worry, it's a step-by-step -step guide. <laughs> but also, I probably need it. <laughs> Um, it's I mean, because frequently you hear thum, 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 and then you, I'm okay, I'm okay. So, so on that note, let's stand up and get our service started.
Um, Joy Miller texts this morning, her brother Jim passed away, and that of course was expected. Uh, nothing is known at this time, of course, uh, they have yet to, to make the funeral arrangements, but uh, continue to be in prayer for Joy and her family and Jim's family as uh, they continue through the grieving process uh, with his passing. Uh, those are all the announcements I have. I uh, do want to share with you, uh, I'll be sharing a financial report for the first six months of our year in next week's bulletin and uh, we are doing well. You have been faithful stewards, giving online as well as uh, giving in the offering plate at the back on the sanctuary table, and uh, we're thankful for that. I, uh, uh, some weeks ago, was asked to take part in a survey of Baptist churches of all different sizes within the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship as to giving patterns of what's happening. And, uh, I could report that we are actually above our budget and we're above giving for last year. And not all churches are that blessed. And so I uh, greatly appreciate your good stewardship uh, in continuing financial support for our congregation. And with that, and let me, let me just say we've got, a, we've got this special this morning that I've been looking forward to. Uh, this is a different rendition than what I grew up with. I grew up listening to a 33 and a third Tennessee Ernie Ford record album on which he does this. And uh, suffice it to say, he, does, he did it a little bit different. But you're gonna be blessed by this thing. If you don't get a blessing out of this, uh, you need to talk to me after service. Something's wrong. You really got something in your life that's messing you up. So I'm looking forward to that. So with that, we'll continue singing. Let's go, ladies.
continuing in our children's sermon to uh, look at the life of Joseph. And we've got quite a little more yet in the book of Genesis to look at. And uh, I trust uh, for our adults, who usually get more out of my children's sermon than they do the regular message, you told me that, uh, that this is either bringing back to memory some things about the stories you learned in Sunday school and vacation Bible school about Joseph, or maybe it's introducing you to some new concepts. We talked today about uh, Joseph the Dreamer. Joseph the Dreamer. Uh, we all have dreams. Some of them are good and some of them are bad. Uh, dreams, that is, when you go to sleep and you dream. Like when I was little, I had that dream that I ate a giant marshmallow and the next morning my pillow was gone. <laughs> you all got that immediately, see? I thought. Uh, he was going, oh no. Anyway, Joseph was the dreamer and he had some special dreams that told him about his future. And it was one of the reasons you may recall a few weeks ago that his brothers didn't care too much for him. One dream he had was they were out harvesting wheat. And the way they harvested wheat back then was they didn't get on a John Deere tractor or a John Deere combine and harvest that way. They went out with a hand sickle, a curved knife, and they would grab the stalks of wheat and cut it off and cut it off till they got a bundle and they would tie it together with a stalk of wheat. There's a way in which you can do that lost ark for most folks. And then they'd stack that bundle over there. And so each one of the brothers are out cutting wheat, making their own little bundles in Joseph's dream. And lo and behold, his bundle stands upright and the 11 bundles of wheat are sheaves that they are all of his brothers all bowed down to him, to his sheaf. And so he goes and tells his brothers this dream. They didn't like it very much. What, you mean one day we're, we're all going to bow down to you because you're the most important? Then he had another dream. And he dreamed that there was the sun and the moon and 11 stars and his star. And the sun and the moon and the 11 stars all bowed down to him. And he goes and tells his father this dream. And Jacob, his father, wasn't too pleased with it either. What? You think that I and your mother and all your brothers are going to bow down to you? Well, keep those dreams in mind for the next couple of weeks. Joseph dreamed about what was going to happen in his life. And so, kiddos, you need to dream about what you want to do with your life. I don't know whether adults would and say, well, I've, I've reached my dream. When I dreamed as a child, when I was a boy, I dreamed of being a lawyer. I don't know exactly why, it's just that the law fascinated me, and even as a little first grader, second and third grader, I would read books about lawyers about our founding fathers, and so many of them were lawyers. And that's what I wanted to be when I grew up. Nobody in my family was a lawyer. I never dreamed of being the preacher in a Baptist church. But I dreamed about being a lawyer. And I achieved that goal. And I practiced law. I served as an administrative law judge, and I finished out my law career, although I still dabble in it a little. But that was my dream. It's the goal toward which I worked, and I should have worked a little harder in high school and college and in law school, but that's water under the bridge. I didn't work as hard as I could have or should have. So my lesson for you young people is whatever it is you have in your mind that you think you want to be, and it may change between now and the time you get through college. But work toward that goal. Dream that dream. And part of that dream is to do the very best you can every day in your 
school work. And we're going to reopen schools in Boone County. I am concerned about it. As important as your education is, I'm more concerned about your life than your education at this point. And so I'm going to be in special prayer that everything is kept safe for that. And it's going to be a challenge for you. You're going to go back into an environment that is totally different. They're going to have to make adjustments for how they're going to teach you. And so you go with the flow. You do your work the best you can. That's all you can do. And in doing that, you're following your dream. You're being a dreamer like Joseph. And doing the very best you can, you will achieve your dreams. We're going to find out Joseph did his. And the core reason that Joseph followed his dreams, his dreams came true, was because he was obedient to God. He always was obedient to God. God. Let us pray. Blessed art thou, Lord God, creator of the universe, who has blessed us with young people, with our kiddos. The important responsibility they are not only to moms and dads, but to all of us. And Lord God, we pray that as they dream what they want to become in life, that within that dream will always be what is most important, and that is following you. And Lord God, we pray now a special blessing upon them as the time comes that they will return to the classroom, that you protect them, protect their teachers, that you give them safety as they continue their studies. In Jesus' name. So I guess probably several months ago, um, Melanie and Alan share songs with us because they come up and sing and play with us. And she shared this one and she goes, what I need you to do is listen to it. Allison Krause has this amazing version. And I was like, oh, yep, love it. We're gonna do this. Well, then I printed out the music and I was like, um, the way she sings it and the way that she sings it, I think the band should do it, but the way it's written is totally different, like two totally different things. So I, <laughs> Wednesday night. I, I really cannot brag enough about how amazing these guys are that play every week because I said this, this the, the way it's written and the way we want to sing it are two totally different things. So if we can just kind of somehow make this happen, it would be really great. And um, I mean, they had to play it a lot of times for us to get our part right. Um, but it just, it was really fun. And so I, I hope that you all are blessed by this. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
theory about this music at home for him. Uh, my theory is this. With this group, and this isn't to diminish one iota, one scintilla of the talent that God has blessed you with and that you have developed. But they have strengthened and increased that talent as a group. They're better than they were two years ago. They get better week by week as I think our minister of music challenges them just as she shared that, hey, we need, we need, need to do it a little different. Uh, I saw the same thing years and years ago when we really didn't have Choir, but step by step it got built and when Don Hubble came on the scene uh, he was able to take and increase that group and do some magnificent things because we were improving week by week and such and you all do you bless me you bless me all right let's get to the message two types of followers Verse 21 of chapter 7 of Matthew's Gospel. Jesus is drawing a line of demarcation. Two weeks ago, he drew a line of demarcation between good and bad prophets or teachers. This week, he draws a line of demarcation as to two types of followers. He opens the passage by saying, not everyone which implies some. What he's about to say, it applies to some who are asserting to be his followers as far as being true or false followers. Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord. Now understand, that is a title of reverence and respect. It is a title which recognizes that Jesus stands in a superior position to them. It is recognizing within that society in which Jesus lived that there were those who were of a higher social standing. Jesus was of a higher standing for those who were his followers who called him Lord, Lord, because he was their master, their rabbi, their teacher, their instructor. And so with due respect, they would call him Lord, Lord. When I was in law school, the tradition was, which sadly they abandoned, that when the professor came into the classroom, we stood. It had come down through the University of Missouri School of Law because in the early years there were judges who were instructors. And so, just as when the judge enters the courtroom, the practice was the instructor enters the courtroom, some of whom happened to be judges, you stood a show of respect for their position. And all through my three years, that's what we did. And then sometime afterwards, the students didn't think that was good. Shouldn't do that. And uh, so the practice was changed. Well, in like manner, Jesus deserves Respect, he deserved the respect of those in the first century who were listening to him, and so they properly would address him as Lord, 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 Rabbi, Master. And what he declares is not everyone who calls me by that title will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now remember when we began this journey through the Sermon on the Mount, we discussed in some detail what Jesus was talking about within the context of the Sermon on the Mount about the kingdom of heaven. And although our minds 
quickly go to, oh, well, that's heaven, life eternal. Where I go when my soul goes when I, when I die. And we discovered, you know what Jesus is talking about to hear now for the people listening to him. Jesus, speaking to the people of his time, his fellow Jews, they expected that upon their passing from this life that their eternal soul would be gathered to the bosom of Abraham or gathered to a place where God dwells. Or as Jesus tells the people on the cross, the day you'll be with me in paradise, a garden. That what Jesus was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount when he says kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God in the book of Matthew is here and now. Bringing in God's kingdom among his people by his people being obedient to him. And so everything that is laid out after that in chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew's Gospel, the Sermon on the Mount, have to do with how do you as an individual, how do I as an individual, if we're going to take it and bring it into the 21st century, how is it that we, in our lives, experience God's kingdom? And so we've come now to this conclusion, and when he says, not everyone who says to me or calls me by the title Lord, Lord, is going to be, is part of that kingdom of God here on earth. Then he says, and notice this, he identifies the individuals who will be part of God's kingdom on earth. Only the one. He tells us up front about who is part of God's kingdom on earth before he tells us who is not. His line of demarcation is first to let us know here are the citizens of God's kingdom. Only the one who does the will of of my Father who is in heaven. Only the one who does the will of the heavenly Father. The one who calls Jesus Lord, Lord and is doing God's will is a citizen of the kingdom of heaven on earth. That's what he's teaching. That's what he wants them to understand. That's the message that he is bringing through as he concludes his teaching, laying out his doctrine, his commentary on the Mosaic Law. He then says, after having identified and drawn this line of demarcation, here is who is a citizen in God's kingdom. Many will say to me on that day, what day? That day can be interpreted the end time when Messiah comes. It can be that day in which God is going to judge those within the kingdom those who purport to be followers. And it appears to be given that within the Gospel of Matthew we have another instance in which a line of demarcation is drawn by Jesus in a parable. And that's over in the 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, verses 31 to 46. I'm not going to read that. As I begin to tell it to you, and some of you have already, oh yeah, we, this is the division of the sheep and the goats. This is when Jesus tells this story. When God shall judge, 
and what his judgment is going to be. And he's going to divide those who are righteous as he divides the sheep on one hand, and those who are unrighteous will be divided on the other hand. And we must remember what the standard for the vision was. Terribly important. Because I think it gives us deeper insight into what it means to be doing the will of the Father as Jesus speaks here. Remember, he says unto those sheep, the ones on the right hand, about all the things that they had done to him. I was hungry, he gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and he gave me a cup of water. I didn't have adequate clothing, and you gave me some clothes. I was sick, and you came and tended to me. I, I was in prison, and you visited me. All of these attributes of personal care for him, for another human being, all of them, if you will, part of the instruction of the Mosaic Law, all being mitzvot, acts of kindness and mercy. You recall, they responded to him and said, when, when did we ever do any of these things for you? And Jesus said, as oft as you did it unto one of the least of these, my brother, you did it to me. And then you recall, he tells just the opposite. Classic Jewish teaching, he tells just the opposite to those who are the unrighteous. You didn't do any of those things for me. You didn't help me in my time of physical need. And they said, no, no, Lord. When did we ignore? When did we fail to do anything when we saw you in need? And the answer comes back from Jesus in as much as you did it not to one of your fellow human beings, you failed to do it to me. feel very comfortable bringing that passage from Matthew to this passage in Matthew and tying the two together. I think it is good scholarship. Why? First of all, it's in the same book. It's a vertical study. We're looking within the Gospel of Matthew. It's the same speaker, Jesus the teacher. And so when he says in the Sermon on the Mount in that day, seems to be this is the day that he tells about and talks about in the 25th chapter. And the two come directly together. What's the will of the Heavenly Father? Do we have any other teaching on this subject within this book by Jesus? And without going into detail and a lot of other parables that I could draw in and say, yes, I think this relates. This is the most correct. This ties directly to this. Doing the will of the Heavenly Father is an act of obedience. Look now at what those who did not do the will of the Father. But Lord, Lord, notice they repeat the title. When Jesus has already said, not everybody that calls me Lord, Lord, is going to be a citizen in the kingdom of heaven. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not speak forth the truth of God in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name? And in your name did we not perform many, many miracles? Stop it then. Jesus has just said, the one who does the will of my Father, citizen of the kingdom. And these people are saying, well, we obviously did the will of the Father. We prophesied, we drove out demons, we did miracles. Those all look like pretty good religious, spiritual things, do they not? 
They certainly, certainly are bigger events, it would seem, than kindness shown to a person in need. And Jesus says, in fact, I would suggest to you, <coughs> based upon my reading within Matthew's Gospel, as well as the other three Gospels, I don't find a place where Jesus tells us that our relationship and fellowship with God is based upon prophesying, casting out demons, and performing miracles. Now, I, I remember when he sent out the 70 or 72, depending upon your account. They went out and they did these mighty things and came back. Jesus commends them for that. I know that. But as far as the teachings that he made day by day through his parables, I suggest to you that these were not the things that he focused on. focused upon how it is we treat one another, which is so consistent with, is totally in line with the second great commandment. It's that simple. It's that beautiful. How is it that I treat other people? That's, that's what the will of the Father is all about. And so to these who call him Lord, Lord, he says to them, to these who prophesied, drove out demons, performed miracles, his response very simply is, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, depart from me, you evildoers, you workers of iniquity. A direct tie back, if you will, to those teachers, those prophets who were not teaching in the will of God. A direct connection. And then next week we're going to see the final piece that he puts to them. So let me just share this simple conclusion with you. My reading of this is that true followers seek to be obedient to the Heavenly Father. As much as is within you, as you can understand and apply the teachings of Jesus to your life, and follow God's will as set forth in the Sermon on the Mount, the most detailed, comprehensive commentary that Jesus makes concerning the relationship of a follower of God and how they carry out and live out that relationship. But that's what we're about. And in so doing, we establish the kingdom of heaven on earth. And I think it is directly applicable to the 21st century of whatever denominational strike we might be if we call ourselves in the name of Jesus to be consistent with what he has taught here, then that's what we need to be doing. One day and one piece at a time that as much as is possible within us that we seek to live out the will of the Father for our life the way in which it touches others. And in so doing, God will identify us as citizens of the kingdom. Let us stand to sing one verse of something about that man.
Kissinger, would you dismiss the city prayer, please? Tony Bob, you're taking this opportunity to be happy to join us again. To worship you, to learn uh, from the teachings of your sermon. God, I just pray that these teachings of the sermon on that one that we've over the last two years uh, would inform our actions, would inform the way that we interact with other people, uh, that as we care for others, that we would be treated as caring for uh, Jesus. Uh, that everyone we interact with is an opportunity to show